Hello everyone, I'm Chester44 and welcome to this Let's Play Blades of Avernum. Last episode, we happened to finish the story of the prisoner. And, well, yeah, take a look at the <laughs> Yeah, it was a uh, bit of a... Bleh, words. Uh, he, got, he basically was a prisoner, managed to escape by... and got in over his head. We saw how it was uh, linked very tightly to uh, the merchant's story. And we saw how the merchant was connected to the knight. The bounty hunter has been showing up throughout this. And I think I've seen the priestess in, one, in a couple of them. One was obvious. She knows the knight. The other, I think, she was uh, in the crowd. Well, it's time to speak with the priestess now, so let's find out her story. A pretty young woman wearing dirtied robes sits on the ground here with her back to the wheel of a trade cart. A plate rests in her lap, and she looks like she's about to begin eating. I'm sorry to intrude, but would you mind talking? No, no, not at all. Take a seat. It wouldn't be the same if there wasn't somebody to share the meal with. Back at the chapel, there was always somebody new eating with us. The different faces kept things interesting. I wouldn't want this to be my first meal alone. There have been so many firsts today, and so many lasts, I couldn't bear for this to be another. So much has happened. Everything is so different now. Tell me about it. The Priestess's Tale. There we are. We'd gathered in the sanctum for morning prayer. Prayer came first every morning at dawn. Father Kay used to say that if we began our day with our minds in the proper state, we'd end the day the same. That morning, though, I was concentrating less on meditation than on the chores that would take the rest of my morning. I knew it was selfish of me, but I was already tired, and the prospect of hard work galled me. Some of the nearby villagers had taken time from their daily routines to attend as well. Some of them were under the care of the order, but others had left their fields and animals to come here. I recited the meditations by rote, and allowed my eyes and mind to drift about the room. They landed on the star emblem above the altar and fixed there. The seven-pointed star was the emblem of the Order of Virtues. It hung proudly on the wall of the Chapel of Compassion, reminding us all of the virtues we were to strive to exhibit in our everyday lives. But nobody ever did. That's what never made sense to me. The virtues were a way to improve the world, but I'd been at the chapel for eight years and things hadn't gotten any better. Once, when I was a child, I asked why Father K. Y. if the virtues were the way to a better world, so many people ignored them. He told me that many people only knew how to find happiness by putting themselves first, but by our example they would see that you could find happiness through others. Compassion was a hard thing to teach. We just had to be patient. Even then I wasn't so sure. Perhaps we were the ones with the wrong idea, and the thieves and criminals were just waiting for us to come to our senses. Suddenly I realized that I was the only one still reciting the prayers. I halted and glanced about to make sure nobody had noticed. Brother Eustace and the villager immediately to my left were looking at me oddly, but nobody else had taken note. They were all distracted by my Brother Matthias, who just interrupted service and was speaking to Father Kay. Father, there's a man at the door. Well, at the doorstep, really, but he's here, and... Well, you should see for yourself. Father, he's in a bad way, and I think he needs care. If he is in need of aid, brother, then he doesn't belong out on the doorstep. Have you brought him inside? No, father, I'm sorry, but I haven't. You see, he's... Well, you should come see for yourself. I wouldn't presume to bring him in here without your permission. You know we take any man here, brother, but no matter. Lead me to him. Father Kay strode out of the room, Matthias leading the way. After a moment, the rest of the congregation followed behind. A crowd had gathered just outside the front door to the south. Morning prayer had ended early because of the interruption.
Father Kay and the others had gathered around a black-clothed man who lay at the doorstep of the chapel. He looked young, but must have been in his late twenties. He wore a black leather tunic, the left sleeve of which was stained with blood from a wound in his upper arm. It didn't appear serious enough to bring him writhing to the floor in pain. But there he was, moaning in agony and weakly thrashing about. Brother Gregor knelt to prop him up into a seated position, and I got my first look at his face. His skin was deathly pale, and he'd bitten his lip hard enough to draw blood. Father Kay ripped away the bloody part of his sleeve to reveal a narrow yet deep stab wound. It was no longer bleeding, but the skin around it was inflamed and sickly. He has been poisoned. We need to— But I was too focused on the wounded man's arm to pay attention. Now that his sleeve was ripped away, I could see a large tattoo in the shape of a curved blade, poorly drawn in black ink and not looking any better for the wound in the center of it. Peasant farmers and rural villagers don't wear sword tattoos. Suddenly the quivering mess before me took on a new, more sinister appearance. At his belt he wore a long, wickedly sharp dirk, above which his hands clutched at his stomach in agony. Hands that had killed. The sooner we begin treatment, the better. Gregor, hold his leg, and— Yes, you too, Matthias. Maria, if you could get the door ready. And Adriana, please run ahead and get a bed ready. All right. Lift on three. One. Gentle now. Two. No! Father Kay was squatting with his hands under the man's arms when I interrupted. He looked up, startled. Uh, I'm sorry, Adriana. Is there a problem? We can't bring this man into the chapel. He's clearly a bandit. Kay studied the man for several seconds and nodded thoughtfully. Yes. Yes, I suppose he is. But it is not our place to judge those that knock at our door. Was he being serious? How could he suggest treating a man who is part of the problem that created all the misery and violence that the Order worked so hard to fix? The men and women that came to the Order for help came because they were desperate, driven from their lands by bandits and forced to abandon pride to accept our charity. Bandits were a veritable plague on these lands, and we were going to aid one? But— There will be no debate. I will not leave a man to die a painful death on our doorstep, even if I knew for certain that he was a wanted killer. Now please run ahead and clear a bed in the infirmary. This time I didn't argue, although on the inside I was considering the painful death option. He would do no better for us if, he, if we were in his position and he ours. I hurried upstairs toward the infirmary. I say hurried, although stormed would probably be more accurate, and hastily threw some new sheets on one of the cots there. Kay and the others weren't far behind. Careful now, lay him. Easy does it. They set him down carefully and immediately began their work. I do not know what type of poison ails him, so we'll just have to treat them all. If this doesn't work, well, we'll have narrowed it down to a very few and nasty venoms. They went about their work with speed and adroitness. I watched on without lending a hand as they wrapped his wound in a gray mold salve and administered an intravenous antivenin. Their work done, Brother Matthias and Gregor left to go about their other duties. I made to follow, but Father Kay's hand on my shoulder stopped me. I would like for you to stay and watch him. He's not in the clear yet until we see that the antivenins are working, and he should be supervised. Are you serious? I don't even want him here. He ignored my complaint and continued on. Give the antivenins some time to do their work, then give him some pinchbug milk to ease the stomach cramps. It's not good to take it on an empty stomach, though, so you might need to give him some food with it. Though if the poisons are still affecting him, he could vomit and asphyxiate, so I'll leave that to your judgment. Um, I have chores to do. Some things are more important than chores. I will see to your duties myself. He turned and left, leaving me standing by the bandit's bedside, flustered and at a loss for words. I didn't know what Father Kay was thinking, why he brought this criminal into the chapel, or why he put me, of all people, to watch over him. I didn't agree, but I sullenly obeyed. I sat on the bed next to him and tried to think of other things. When I did have to attend to him, I'd try to forget who he was, but it never worked. I couldn't help but feel that by healing him I was hurting friends. I didn't wish anyone else to experience what I have, but Father Kay had ordered it. 
I sat there for what felt like a lifetime. Color was returning to the man's face, and he was no longer sweating or struggling for breath. This would usually be a reassuring sign. It meant the poison was leaving his system. But I took no joy in it. The sooner he was healed, the sooner he was out pre preying on the innocent again. The sun had set, and I was still keeping my vigil. Occasionally, Brother Gregor, who was in charge of the clinic, came in to see how things were going. But for the most part, I was left alone with my thoughts and my anger. A noise from the bed beside me drew my attention. I was startled into almost knocking over my chair when I saw that the man's eyes were open and staring right at me. Where am I? What happened? I warily took my seat again, ever suspicious and on alert for any quick movements. It was ridiculous. I knew the poison would leave him weak as a child, but turning your back on a bandit just isn't wise, not even an incapacitated one. You're in the Chapel of Compassion. You are poisoned somehow, probably in the midst of some nefarious act. Wait a minute. This is sly. This must be just after. You are in the Chapel of Compassion. You were poisoned somehow, probably in the midst of some nefarious act. I filled on him in on how he appeared at our doorstep, his treatment, and his rapid recovery thanks to the work of the monks of the chapel. He seemed... Well, he seemed genuinely thankful. Brigands are champion actors. Well, thanks. I really owe you guys one, I guess. The name's Sly, by the way. Chris Sly. He sagged back against his pillows tiredly. He lay there with his eyes closed for a while. I thought he had fallen asleep. But suddenly he spoke. I, I don't suppose I'm going to learn the name of my savior. I'm not the one you should be thanking. Uh, suit yourself. You don't seem to be the talkative type, so I guess I'll talk for the two of us. I'm adrift by trade, although what that entails is probably not something to be discussed in a church. Not that I'm much of a church man, but I think I have an idea. Well, I think I know that my kind isn't condoned. The kind of trade isn't condoned. But you'd be surprised, ma'am, how my evangelizing is a lot like yours. I don't see much compassion out there, so I've kind of made it a habit to make compassion. To turn greed and envy into generosity. Kind of my thing, you could say. My parishioners aren't usually aren't too happy about how saintly I make them. I guess it's the way I go about my preaching that irks them. It certainly seems like there have been more attempts on my life than your average missionary. <laughs> he chuckled at his own joke, but I was too on edge to be amused by his blaspheming. You should be doing less talking and more resting. Appreciate your concern, but I'm not in the habit of sleeping when there's a trained killer out to get me. I'll keep one eye open. A trained killer? I didn't know what he was talking about, but it couldn't be anything but trouble. Fortunately, Father K stepped through the door at that moment, saving me from having to deal with the brigand any longer. Father K strode into the room as if on cue. Seeing that the patient's eyes were open, he rushed over to the bedside. First, though, he turned to address me. "'You may go now, Adriana. I'm sorry about all this, but you've done a good thing here, whether you know it or not.' That was it. I stood still for several seconds, but Father K had already turned to speak with the brigand. I left the clinic in a daze. So, that must be... That is Sly. The way he's talking now, it sounds like he, uh... Sly intends to be a Robin Hood-style character. Stealing from those more fortunate and giving to those less fortunate. He's been showing up throughout all this. Hmm... I wasn't ready to return to my room. The whole bandit incident had me too riled up for sleep. The sun had already set, and although Brother Gregor had brought a sandwich up to the clinic for my lunch, I had not anything to s had anything to eat since. I could hear the noise of merriment coming from the dining hall, but was not in the mood to join then. Instead, I headed for the inner sanctum, forsaking the fellowship of my friends for silent reflection. To tell the truth, I never spent much time in the inner sanctum. I mean, I always attended services, but I just didn't spend much time there on my own. 
It wasn't that I didn't like the religious side of the order. It just didn't make much sense to me when Father K wasn't there to guide. It was all fine at prayer service, but on my own it was... well, awkward. I knelt, but my mind wasn't on prayer. I was looking for silence, and I'd found it. My eyes landed on the star above the altar yet again. It was placed there for just that reason, so that it would command attention. It was a simple thing, but what it stood for was anything but simple. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Compassion is so black and white. But what if it isn't? <coughs> Father K. approached to kneel beside me. I didn't say anything, though it was clear that he'd come to speak with me. I was ashamed to realize that I was actually angry with him. For a while we remained that way. Father K. knelt in prayer, and I sitting back in the pew. The silence had grown oppressive. I fidgeted anxiously and tried to concentrate on something besides the awkward silence. Father K. sat motionlessly, though, intent on his prayer and apparently paying no heed to my deliberate snub. Finally I broke. I'm sorry. For what, child? He spoke calmly and levelly, not reprimanding or stern. It was like he'd forgotten about earlier. Anger welled within me. He was going to make me spell out the whole thing when he knew full well what I was talking about. Still, I'd already started, so I might as well go on and get it out in the open. For the way I acted earlier, the way I acted with the... patient. There is nothing to apologize for, my daughter. I know that compassion is no easy thing to practice, especially not to those who have hurt us most. It is no easier for me. You are not the only one to have lost much to wicked men. Revenge is not the answer, though. You show your strength by putting aside your anger and hatred. It is not easy for old men like myself, and much less so for a hot heart like yours. I am sorry for disappointing you. You have never disappointed me, child, never in the ten years since Logan brought you to us. I did what I did to teach you. Perhaps I went too far. I am often harder on you than any of the others because I expect more from you. And I've always gotten what I expected, even today. I just didn't want to bring harm to the chapel. There is no shame in being concerned for those you love, but we cannot let fear stop us from doing what is right. What happened at King's Dell will not happen again. You must believe that, or you can only live in fear. I know that Logan's extended absence weighs on your heart, as it does on mine, but we are safe here, even without our protector. Thank you, Father. He rested his hand on my shoulder. You will not lose another family, Adriana. You must believe this. And with that the hand was gone, and with it seemed to go a great burden from my mind. I hardly heard the retreating footsteps as he left the inner sanctum I was so overcome. I sagged back in the pew and allowed my eyes to close. All the stress, anxiety, and anger had seeped away, and exhaustion rushed in to take their place. For the first time in, what's, in a what seemed like ages, since Logan left, I suppose, I sank into a deep sleep. I woke with a start. I was unsure what it was that had disturbed my slumber, but a feeling of uneasiness had come over me. I climbed to my feet and gasped in pain from the cricks in my back. Have you ever slept on a wooden pew? Well, I don't advise you to try. Oh, dear. I walked down the aisle towards the doors. I would convinced myself that nothing was the matter. There was no reason to worry. Yet the feeling of uneasiness persisted. There was a row of tall windows above the double doors that led out of the inner sanctum. They provided a view of the second floor of the chapel above. Something in the corner of my eye caught my attention, and I glanced up. There was a man there. I just got a glimpse of him, but I could tell he was no monk. He was tall and sinister and strode with a purpose. He wore a dark tunic made of an unfamiliar material, and a midnight black cloak swirled behind him. It seemed to suck up all the light around him, leaving a trail of darkness as it passed and obscuring any details about the man himself. My heart was in my throat. I stood frozen for an instant and then slowly walked forward as if coming out of a trance before breaking into a headlong sprint towards the doors. The sounds of merriment no longer came from the dining hall to the south. Indeed, the entire room was eerily silent. There was no noise from anywhere in the chapel. I had sprinted to the doorway to the dining room. 
Once I was there, I proceeded hesitantly, reluctant to turn the corner and come face to face with what I expected, dreaded, to see. The dining room was in a state of chaos. Splintered furniture and smashed dishes were strewn about the room, and among them lay the battered bodies of several monks and their guests. There was no sign of their attacker, but I had already concluded who was responsible. The bandit. I couldn't even think about Sly without wanting to scream, to tear my hair in frustration and beat the walls. I'd been right, but they were all too blind to see it, and now what I'd most dreaded had come true, and I was helpless to prevent it. But there was no time for thoughts like that. There was work to be done. I hurried to kneel beside one of the monks. Brother Colin and checked his pulse. It was faint, but still there. He'd suffered a tremendous head wound and was unconscious. A shout from elsewhere in the chapel interrupted my diagnosis. It sounded like it had come from upstairs. My thoughts jumped to the cloaked man on the overlook. Torn between tending to Brother Colin and going to the source of the commotion, I stood frozen. Another shout finally tore me from the unconscious monk's side. Now that I was up, though, I was no longer hesitant. I left the room with a purpose, sprinting towards the source of the sound. Even without seeing his face, I immediately realized his intruder wasn't sly. He was something entirely outside of anything I'd ever seen, and much more threatening than a bandit. Up close, his cloak was even more disorienting, whipping about his body as if blown by a gale, though there was no breeze to disturb it. He had shoulder-length raven-black hair and stood tall and confident, a man who had never known fear, and facing him was none other than Father Kay. I will not let you harm him while he is under my protection. I will ask you again to leave. He wasn't at all intimidated. Short, aged man facing him down this otherworldly character. The intruder scoffed at him, clearly not intimidated. Fool! You would stand between a wraith and his prey. Your life is forfeit. Perhaps, but I gave my life to serve these people long ago. I would gladly give it again. And that was all. One second he was standing there, and then the next. Oh, God. He moved with blinding speed. I hardly had time to open my mouth before he was already across the hall. His sword was in his hand, although I don't even remember seeing him draw it. And just as suddenly it was in Father Kay's chest. I stood in silent horror, staring at the surreal scene with mouth agape. Blood ran from the corner of Father Kay's mouth and welled from the wound that, was cl that his clutching hands were powerless to stop. I was paralyzed, rooted in place by the shock of it all. The cloaked man, though he had though had already moved on the, into the infirmary without giving a second thought to his victim. It wasn't until Kay went crashing to the floor that the spell was broken and I could rush to his side. Tears flooded down my face as I cradled the head of the kindest, wisest, most patient and gentle man I'd ever knew. He'd been my adopted father for ten years, and in that time I don't think he ever raised his voice. There was nothing I could do to help him. Some things are beyond healing. The only medicine is prevention. I'd failed at that. All I could do was sob in frustration. I was too late. I had seen it coming, but I hadn't done anything. I'd felt it in my stomach from the start, when I first saw Sly lying at the door. But I'd done nothing. I could do nothing. And now it was happening again. Father Kay had said it wouldn't, but his promises turned out to be as empty as usual. He can never guarantee anything, just relied on the goodwill of others, and trusted that they'd respond the way that he expected. The way they should. But what the hell does a monk know about wicked men? There's nothing worth knowing about wicked men except how to protect yourself from them. i have been wasting my time learning to minister to the sick and wounded, but I couldn't even protect myself, let alone those I loved. Useless. Years of training with herbs and scalpels did nothing where a sharp piece of steel could have solved everything. All bloody useless. I'd nearly forgotten that the killer was still here. Even the sound of footfalls and the brush of his swirling cloak as he passed by went largely unheeded. He seemed just as content to ignore me as I was to ignore him. I just sat there, gasping for breath and struggling not to faint. I could feel the blackness creeping around me. My vision was blurred, but it wasn't from the tears. Even sitting down I felt dizzy. I was breathing so shallowly, and my heart was racing so quickly. I must have collapsed. Everything was falling apart, and I did nothing but weep. I did nothing, and it killed me to admit that that it was all I could do. 
all I could feel was an overwhelming helplessness and fear. I was paralyzed by it. There are people who would have rose up and done something. People who don't sit back and let things happen to them, but act to shape things the way they want them to be. But I suppose a person like that wouldn't have let this happen in the first place. If Logan had been here, he wouldn't have let this happen. He would have faced down our foes like he always did, because he knew nobody else was strong enough to do it. That was never my thing, I suppose. I wasn't the one for, hero for heroics or bravery. I'd leave that up to others. I'd patch up the wounds they got while fighting for me if I could. If I could. If I was at their side at all. If I wasn't too late. Something happened then. Like a bolt of lightning striking a long, parched forest, the magnitude of what had just happened, and my role in it, lit my dull fear and helplessness into a raging blaze. I was on my feet, although I couldn't imagine why, and I was running, although I couldn't have said where. But there was something that had to be done. And I knew even in my blind fury what it was, and that I was the only one left to do it. <coughs> I leapt down the stairs, legs pumping and chest heaving as I sprinted towards fate knows what. I didn't realize what, what I was running to until I saw him. You do best to return to your friends, wench. He wore a gray metal mask shaped in fate knows what terrifying form. It hid his face from me, but not his gaze. The mask seemed to soak up all the light that struck it, and his eyes seemed to shine it right back out. I flinched then. It was so unnerving to stare down that spectral glow. I averted my eyes. I had no choice, and I almost simply followed his advice and abandoned this madness. I don't know what I had been planning to do. I don't suppose I had a plan at all. But the pointlessness of facing down a trained and well-armed man pierced through fu the furious haze that clouded my mind. I was unarmed and untrained, and the overwhelming futility rose up and, for a moment at least, quelled my anger. But even as I was about to turn back, my eyes fell on a torch hanging on the wall, and the sight of its flickering flame seemed to set me afire once again. I snatched it from, my st from its sconce and leapt at the intruder. At least I was no longer unarmed. All the anger and fury that I could muster was no substitute for my opponent's agility and skill. He easily sidestepped my flailing attempts to strike him. Whenever it seemed I'd land a blow, at the last moment his blade would flash out to knock it aside. I collapsed and let the torch roll from my hand, as much as my frustration and exhaustion as from the blows I'd received during the fight. Such a pretty thing. What a shame. Hmm. When I came to, I was lying in the dirt road leading up to the chapel. My robes were singed and my skin and hair were coated with ash, but I was alive. How I'd mustered the strength and will to get out, I'll never know. At the time, you'd have been hard-pressed to convince me that it was a good thing, but through some sick twist of fate, I had survived. The smoldering remains of the chapel lay some fifty feet away, glowing dimly from the scattered fires that still sputtered among the wreckage. There was nothing there for me except the memory of my failures. I got to my feet shakily. I wanted to run away from there, but I could hardly even stand. I had to get away. I had to put the ruins and what happened there out of my memory. I was startled by the sound of a horse nickering from behind me. I turned to find a, a sorry-looking piebald, no doubt the property of one of the peasants that had come to visit the chapel. A rope tied to a stake trailed from its neck, which it must have torn from the ground in the terror of the fire, now that it had forgotten its fear and had wandered back. If only I could have done the same. And here is where I shall pause, as this episode has gone on long enough. I think I'm starting to put together the story of what's going on with this Christopher Sly and the Bounty Hunter, and how everyone else is connected in their own ways. They, Christopher Sly and the Bounty Hunter seem to be the sole connecting thing between all of these, even if only in the background. Sure, the story with uh, the rebel forces, that's one thing. We've already seen how that works out between the merchant and the... What is it? The merchant and the thief. Uh, the prison. Excuse me. The merchant and the prisoner. But Christopher Sly has still been in the background and has shown up in every story so far. And he's obviously going to play a big part in the bounty hunter's story because he's shown up as well. 
Either way, we'll see more of the Priestess' story in the next episode. Till then, I'm Chesser44, that is a Priestess. This has been a Blades of Avernum Let's Play, and I shall see you all next time.